choir. Let's pray together. Father, that is why we are here today. It's because out of our sorrow, we've been invited to step into your light. We're amazed that when we finally come to our senses, as the story you told about the prodigal son and we come home, we're amazed to find a loving Father that is waiting for us and receives us and kills the fatted calf and throws a party and that heaven rejoices because one sinner has found their way home. Father, we thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the good news of eternal life. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to share this good news with those who need, still need to hear it. Father, at this time, we still ourselves under the teaching of Scripture and your Spirit. We ask that you would speak to us, encourage us with your truth, challenge us with your truth. And may we hear you speak to our deep soul as we give you our attention and focus and energy. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you've got your copy of the Word of God, if you'll join us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Today we're going to read probably what is the best well-known parable that Jesus told. Parable, of course, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the sower, probably two best known parables that Jesus tells, and today we're going to read the parable of the sower. But I want us to pay attention, this is one of these stories that most of us know so well we could probably read it without even lo looking at the scriptures, right? But I want us to pay attention this morning to how, Luke, uh, excuse me, how Mark tells the story, how Mark puts this together in his presentation. Before we read it together, I just want to remind you kind of where we have come in the gospel. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus uh, comes on the scene in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, preaching about the kingdom of God. As he just comes on the scene and he's preaching the kingdom of God. As he preaches the good news of the gospel, he's getting various responses. The crowd, by and large, is excited about his preaching, primarily because he does all these miracles and all these healings, and he's casting out demons, and they're just completely amazed at everything that they see. But they're also kind of astonished at what he's teaching. He teaches differently. He teaches as one who has authority. Uh, the demons are even subjected to him. He proclaims things like he has the ability to forgive sins, like he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, so the, the crowds have this kind of astonished amazement as they follow him. His own family doesn't quite know what to do with him. At one time they try to find him. They want to seize him because they think he's out of his mind. But then there's these apostles who have left everything and have devoted their life to follow him because they believe in him so much. And then there's the religious leaders that their conclusion about this guy is the way he's able to do all these things is because he's possessed by Satan himself. So here's Jesus preaching the good news of the kingdom to a wide variety of responses. Crowd's kind of excited. His family thinks he's kind of crazy. Uh, the apostles sell everything to follow him. The other religious leaders think he's possessed with the demon. So he's, he's preaching the message into a wide variety of responses, and now we come to Mark chapter 4. And again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so he got into a boat, and he sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. Pay attention to that phrase. That phrase is going to come back later. He was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching. So one of the parables he's going to say to us, in his teaching, he said to them, verse 3, Listen, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. 
Other seeds fell into the good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. He said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, the story that Jesus tells seems strange to us in our modern farming. But, of course, this is probably a poor, poor guy farming his field, scattering seed everywhere. He had parts of his field that had not removed all the rocks yet. He had parts that had thorns in it. He had parts that the neighbors just refused to walk around his field and kept walking through the field. So there was a beaten path, and he just scattered seed everywhere. And in that method, you would throw your seed first, and then you'd come back and plow up the land, and you'd hope for the best. So he tells this parable, and then this is one of the few parables, we look in verse 14, where Jesus himself interprets the parable. And he interprets as an allegory. Everything in the parable stands for something. The path's going to stand for something. The rocky soil is going to stand for something. The thorn's going to stand for something. The good soil, the, the seed itself stands for something. But you notice there's one thing about the parable that Jesus does not interpret. The sower himself. In the parable, everything else has a meaning, but he never tells us about the sower. And we're left to wonder as we read the interpretation, who's the sower of the parable? Is Jesus talking about himself? As he said, as I've come and I've been sowing the message of the kingdom, I've been spreading the gospel, and I've been getting a wide variety of responses. Is he telling the parable to his apostles? Remember, the apostles were ones that he called to be with him so he could send them out to preach. And said, hey, I just want you to realize I'm going to send you out to preach, and this is what your life is going to look like. You're going to spread the gospel everywhere. Or is he telling the parable to you and me? Remember, you and I are ambassadors for Christ. God is now making his appeal through us to the world around us, and we are sowing the news of the kingdom. Is he telling the parable to us? As you go out to sow, this is what you can expect. Well, it's probably all the above, isn't it? Jesus said, this is my experience. The apostles, this is going to be your experience. And to us 2,000 years later, this will be your experience. Sower goes out to sow. Now, what he's sowing, he says, is the word. The word of the kingdom, the good news, the message that there is a kingdom, there is a king. We've been invited into this kingdom by God's grace through faith, and he sows the word. So those are along the path, verse 15, where the word was sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. As Matthew records the parable, Jesus says that they hear, but they don't understand. And Satan snatches the word away from them. So from the very beginning, Jesus is saying to us, in the business of spreading the word, it is a spiritual battle. Satan is in opposition to people who are trying to hear the gospel, and we are trying to tell the gospel. It's not just spreading information. It's not just convincing people of the truth. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place, and Satan is working hard to snatch it away. It reminds us of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul says, The God of this world is blinding the eyes of the unbelieving so they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, this has been my experience. Sometimes I've been spreading the news of the gospel and people just don't understand. They just don't get it. He says to the apostles, it's going to be your experience. And he says to us, it's going to be our experience. Some seed falls along the path. Verse 16, and these are the ones sown on the rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. And then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Notice, these are the ones that immediately receive the word with joy. And Jesus is probably thinking about the crowd. Those who have heard his message of the kingdom, and they're all excited about it immediately, immediately receives it with joy. But there is a difference between receiving the message of the kingdom with joy and salvation. Now, you know this in life. There's a difference between initial response of joy to something and actually buying into it. It's when your friend calls you who works at a different company and says, you know, we have an opening over here. I think that you'd fit into this real well. I would like for you to consider this job. And immediately you initially respond with joy. That sounds really cool. And then you find out more about the job. You find out about the benefits package and the salary. You find about the, the company. You wonder about the job security with the company. You, you have to relocate. You begin to think about all that. And so upon further investigation, even though you initially responded with joy, you 
No, thank you. Or have you been looking for a house? Right? You pull up in front of the house, and initially you respond with joy. The house looks great. You tour it. It's got a good layout. And initially you're really excited about it. But then you get the price. Then the home inspector tells you there's a problem with the foundation. Then you find out that the city's got a highway plan for the next block over. And you, upon further review, you, you initial response of joy, you say, no. And Jesus is saying there's a lot of people that initially respond with joy to the message of the kingdom, but upon further review, it's kind of a no thank you. Two things he talks about. He talks about those who are afflicted because of the word and those who are persecuted. Be persecuted means to be treated cruelly because of your faith. Affliction just means to be pressed in. Persecution implies that there's another person treating you cruelly because of the faith. Affliction just says there are some times where it's a cost to follow Jesus. Remember when Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. This is another way of saying there are some people who initially respond with joy to the message of the kingdom until they realize there's a cross that comes with this. There is a price to be paid. And as they begin to realize the price is when they begin to say, no thanks, and they fall away. Jesus is telling his apostles, I scattered sea like that all the time. All these crowds out here initially are real excited, but in not so many days, they're going to be the same ones who gather around and say, crucify him, crucify him. The next sea, verse 18. Others are the ones sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the word, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The seed that fell among the rocky soil were those who initially responded with joy and then realized, wait a minute, there's a cost that goes with this. Those among the thorn are those who receive the word with joy, but then they begin to do a treasure analysis in their life. And they... They're stumbled up by the deceitfulness of riches, the riches of this world, the deceit, the hope that they hold out. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross, but he also said you have to deny yourself. There's a treasure analysis that you and I have to do. There's a treasure of this world, and there's a treasure of the kingdom. And, and as we receive the message of the kingdom, we have to decide which treasure will we value the most. And notice there's some who will do this analysis overtly. They, the deceitfulness of riches. They will choose the riches of this world over the riches of this kingdom. There are others who will do this analysis maybe not even knowingly. It's just the anxieties of life choke it out. It's not so much that you said, I want to pursue the treasures of this world, but it's just simply there's so many cares. You are functionally pursuing the treasures of this world, and you're functionally turning away from the treasures of the kingdom. Jesus is saying to the apostles, and he's saying to us, sometimes you're out there and you're sowing the word. And there's going to be people who they will hear it, and they'll initially respond with joy, but then they'll do a treasure analysis, and they'll say, I don't find that worthy of being pursued. Verse 20, those who are sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold. Notice Mark's three phrase. They hear it, they accept it, or they receive it. They receive it unto themselves, and they bear fruit. All through the New Testament, the demonstration of genuine salvation is that you continue in your faith to the end, and you bear fruit. And so those who receive the word and bear fruit are those that were hard-pressed because of the word, but they continue. They were the ones who were persecuted because of the word, yet they continue. They were the ones that were tempted with the treasures of this world and, and yet stayed focused on the treasures of the kingdom. They were the ones who refused to allow the cares of this world to choke it out. They continued to bear fruit. It's interesting, Jesus lets us know that there are different kinds of fruit that we bear. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We all have a good work that God has created us to do. We're all being measured against that, not against each other. But to hear, to receive, and to bear fruit. That's what it means to receive the good news of the kingdom. 
Now, before we get to kind of a, a conclusion this morning, I want you to notice something about how Mark tells this parable. And so I want you to come uh, to see two things about how Mark structures the parable. First of all, there's this little parenthetical thought between verses 10 and 13, between the telling of the parable and the interpretation of the parable. And then we're also going to see, as Mark tells the parable, he tells two other parables that he means for us to hear in conjunction with this parable. So first, let's look at this little parenthetical thought, verses 10 through 13. He's told the parable. He's about to give the interpretation. But in between that, he says, when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom. But for those outside, everything is in parables. Now, when the New Testament uses the word secret, uh, we... It's really the word mystery. We use the word mystery to say something you don't know. And the New Testament uses the word mystery to say something that's previously been unknown, but now God has revealed to us. So the mystery has been made known to us in Christ. And here Jesus is saying, I'm revealing to you plainly about this mystery, but to others it's been told in parables. And then he quotes in verse 12, a verse from Isaiah 6. He says, so that they may indeed see but not perceive may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you then understand all the parables? Now it sounds like in verse 12 what Jesus is saying, I'm telling this in parables because I don't want other people to hear and believe, which doesn't really sound very Jesus-like. And so here we remember as we read Scripture, two very important principles about reading Scripture. Number one, we let Scripture interpret Scripture. And number two, when you come to a passage of Scripture that is confusing, we allow the passages that are very clear to help us interpret the passage that is confusing. So, for instance, in other clear passages, we know that it's Jesus' desire for everyone to come to forgiveness. So Jesus said, whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 1 says that whoever believes in him, he's given the right to become children of God. So he, he wants everyone to come to faith. So what is he saying here? Well, part of the message is, we, we've already seen in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus healed uh, uh, the leper, and he said, told the leper, don't tell anybody, go just show yourself to the priest, but don't say anything. We've seen him do this a couple of times, and because in, in, as Jesus is unfolding his life and unfolding the Gospel, he's working towards the appointed time to die on Passover. And so he doesn't want that to happen ahead of time. He doesn't want the religious leaders to, for him to be... Uh, clearly reveal who he is so that they will uh, try to arrest him before the appointed time. There's a little bit of this secret motif that's going on. But I think the bigger thing that helps us understand this is the context of where Jesus quotes this from. He quotes it from Isaiah 6. Now, you're not probably not familiar with Isaiah 6, but you are. Isaiah 6 is when Isaiah has this vision. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the angels surrounding the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Sound familiar? Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And the angel takes the fire off the altar and touches his tongue and forgives his sin. And then the voice from heaven says, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Sound familiar? That's the first half of Isaiah 6. It's the second half of Isaiah 6 where God basically, and I'll summarize it for it, says to Isaiah, I'm sending you to people who should listen to you, but they won't. Matter of fact, the more that you speak to them, the harder their heart is going to get. To which Isaiah says back to God, that doesn't sound like much fun. How long do you want me to do that? And God says, you keep doing that until it's the time that I'm going to pass judgment on my people. So, who will go for us? Isaiah says, I'll go. And he says, all right, you're going to go to people they should listen, but they won't. Matter of fact, the more you speak, the harder their hearts are going to get. And Isaiah says, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. Now, why does Jesus pull Isaiah 6 into the middle of the parable of the soul? Chew on that for a second. Now, the second thing I want you to see is as Mark presents this, there are two other parables that he means for us to read in connection with the parable of the soul. The first one is in chapter 4, verse 26. Mark's the only gospel writer that tells us this parable. It says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like the parable of the sower, right? But it's different. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. 
The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now Jesus is not saying that all a farmer has to do is plant the seed and walk away and come back months later and it's done. There are, it, obviously there's a lot of farming to be done between that. But what he is saying is when that seed is in the ground, there's a lot of that growth of the seed that is a mystery to the farmer and the farmer can't see it. A lot of this stuff is happening below the dirt and you can't tell what's going on and then suddenly you see. Paul said to the church in Corinth, he said, I was the one that planted the gospel message. Another missionary, Apollos, came along and watered it. But God was the one who caused the growth. So here's a parable. Because the, the parable of the sower sounds very depressing. You're going to sow the seed and a lot of folks aren't even going to hear it. A lot of folks are going to hear it, but they're going to decide they don't really want it, and other folks are going to hear it and decide they'd really go after the treasures of this world. That's kind of depressing. He tells us there's, there's a hidden work with the seed going on that you can't see under the soil. The next parable, he says in verse 30, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, puts out large branches that even the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Very simple parable. The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows up in terms of garden plants, it's one of the largest bush, so big that even birds can come in. This seed that you're scattering all over will grow large than you can ever imagine. And then just to see how Mark finishes the section. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. You see how as Mark tells these parables, he bookends the parables by saying, Jesus taught them many parables. Jesus, with many parables, he taught them. And in between, he gives us three parables. And I think he intends for us to hear all three parables together. One of the ways we, we hear the parable of the sower, we tend to hear this, and, and it's good to hear it as this, uh, asking ourselves, what kind of soil are we? How have we received the word of the kingdom? Uh, are we the soil that uh, immediately has received it with joy, but we're realizing there's a price to be paid for the, to the message of the kingdom, and we're not willing to pay that price, or, or there's persecution that's coming, or... or are we the soil that it's being choked out by a treasure analysis? And we're more enticed by the treasure of this world. Or are we the kind of soil that bears fruit? And, and it's good for us to hear it that way. But here's how I want you to hear the parable this morning. I think Jesus is trying to encourage the sower. I think Jesus is trying to give a word of encouragement to the apostles and a word of encouragement to you and to I. Anyone who is invested in sowing the word, Jesus is trying to give us encouragement through this parable. Just a few words of encouragement to sowers this morning before we leave. First, just five quick words. I think Jesus would encourage us this morning to keep sowing the word across a wide variety of soils. You may think you know what kind of soil your coworker is, or your neighbor is, or that family member is, but the truth is you don't. Uh, when I was uh, 18, back in those days, you know, when you knew everything, uh, mission trip with my church, we were doing beach witnessing in South Padre Island. So the idea was we set up the church bus on the beach after we got it stuck on the beach and had it towed, but that's another story. We got it on the beach, set up a volleyball court there on the beach, and we're just handing out free drinks, playing volleyball. And then the idea was play volleyball for a little bit and then to try to engage in a spiritual conversation with whoever came up. Um, so Jerry Stamps was my Sunday school teacher. He was the one working with our section of volleyball, and these two guys walk up. One guy is clean cut. The other guy uh, looks like he just washed up from some other world. Uh, you know, just one of the long-haired, unkempt kind of guys. And so immediately, of course, you size up what kind of soil are we dealing with. Clean cut is going to be the receptive soil. Right? Unkept guy is going to be the rocky soil. 
And so as we're playing volleyball, I was trying to position myself so that when we kind of divided that I got clean cut guy, right? And so Jerry got the other guy, I got clean cut guy, and uh, trying to stir spiritual conversations and all, and he, he had no interest in it at all. Just cut me off, walked away. I'm sure it had nothing to do with my dazzling gospel presentation. I'm sure it was his heart. So I was going to go find Jerry and say, well, I guess this one was a bust. And, and I turned. He was on the other side of the bus and went to the other side of the bus. And long-haired hippie dude was on his knees in the sand praying the sinner's prayer with Jerry as Jerry was leading him to salvation in Christ. We make assessments of other people of what kind of soil they are. And so we decide it's not worth our time to to throw the, the word that way, and it's not worth our time to throw the word that way because we don't think they're appropriate soil. And Jesus is encouraging the sowers, keep sowing the word. You may think you know what kind of soil you're working with, but you don't. Keep sowing the word. I think Jesus would encourage sowers today by just reminding us, rejection's part of the fraternity. Jesus is saying to the apostles, look, this has been my experience I'm out here sowing the message of the kingdom. Some people just flat don't understand it. There's a bunch of crowds that initially respond with joy, but, don't, but in a little bit they're going to really get it and they're going to turn away. There's others that kind of like the idea, but once they figure out that the treasure of the kingdom is different from the treasures of this world, like the rich young ruler, uh, they'll fall away. It, it's been my experience that the apostles, it's been their experience. Folks, it's going to be our experience as well you're anything like me, one of the things that keeps you from being willing to share the gospel with others is the fear of rejection, right? I'm going to try to speak about the good news of the kingdom with someone and they're going to laugh or mock or say I'm not interested. All the encouragement this morning is that Jesus is saying welcome to the club. It's part of the call. And instead of letting that keeping us from sowing the word is to simply embrace it that this is part of what it means to sow the word. It's part of what it means to join Jesus in his work that we will sow the words of the kingdom and there will be many, probably the majority, that will say, thank you, no. I find it encouraging that as Jesus is in sowing the word, notice that he addresses barriers to faith just very up front. I think one of the ways that we try to share the gospel in our culture today really is a lot like bait and switch of a used car salesman. You ought to come to Jesus. Look at everything Jesus can do for you. He'll make you a better father, a better husband. Uh, your finances will be blessed. You'll be a better co you know, career. Everything will be great. Look what God can do for you. And then once they say yes, we say, you know, we say to them, oh, by the way, you know, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. I'm like, wait a minute, that wasn't what I was sold. What I was sold is that God's going to do for me, and now you're telling me that, that I've got to serve him. It's kind of a bait and switch, and yet Jesus here is just real up front with it. Look, there, there, there is a price to following me. You will be afflicted because of the word. You will come to a time in your life that to be obedient to the message of the kingdom is going to cause you to be hard-pressed, and you will want to say, I quit. Just letting you know. You will be persecuted because of the word. Just letting you know. There will be people who treat you cruelly because you embrace the message of the kingdom. There will be times in your life where you will look at the treasures of